I think we can get started now. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to uh, Summer of Drawing. Um, although we're, we're heading into winter of drawing because I've got my sweater on, I'm enjoying the cool weather that we're having at the moment. So today, the second half of colored pencils. And thank you so much for people who got in touch and told me where you know where you were having trouble. I I noticed in uh, because I had pre-recorded the class last week that some of my own colored pencil sketches that I was doing as examples just didn't show the full color. And that's, you know, that's uh, sort of unfortunate, but I'm hoping I can get around that this week and give you a better sense. I will say that, um, you know, color theory in general, uh, th that's not something you learn in an hour or two. But what I'm going to try to do, you know, sort of as I, I was beating the Notan idea into everyone's head, I also um, want to start you thinking in certain ways about color as you use uh, particular colors to paint anything, you know, a lemon, an apple, a plant, a, an animal, um, because these, these lessons will apply no matter what it is that you're trying to, to draw or paint. So we're just going to dive in today because I've got some fun stuff. And you'll be very glad to know we're drawing one thing for a long time <laughs> today, and I'm taking you through it step by step. Um, in fact, I ended up drawing uh, this little scene very quickly in the time frame that I'm giving you. So, uh, you know, it certainly managed my <laughs> expectations and I hope it'll manage yours. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start screen sharing right now. So welcome back to Summer of Drawing. We're on class number 16 out of 20. So this is the last one on colored pencils and we'll be moving into uh, folds and animals <laughs> over the next couple of weeks. Um, but for the moment, um, let's concentrate back on, on colored pencils. And I wanted to, to tell you just very quickly, um, I usually use Prismacolor Premier pencils. But for this week, I experimented by using the Faber-Castell Polychromos, which was an excuse for me to get some, <laughs> some more colored pencils as if I needed an excuse. Um, and then there's also another variety which is really popular called Prismacolor Very Thin. So let me just talk very quickly about these. Um, Prismacolors, which I'm used to, are a waxed base core. So they tend to uh, be a little softer. I can use them in, a, in an electric pencil sharpener, but I have found that if I drop the pencil or if I torque it too much with a small pencil sharpener, it is difficult to sharpen. But on the plus, they are relatively soft, so they have an intensity of color that builds up quickly, and I really like that. I'm also, you know, pretty used to the varieties. If you use paint or, or colored pencils or anything like that, you know how you get used to what a certain color will do. So when I moved this last week to doing, um, using the polychromos to see what those were like, um, first thing, of course, the names are different. So a color I might expect to look one way might look a, a slightly different way. So just like with any palette of colors, you know, if you're, if you're trying these out, you'll need to get used to what the different colors can do. Really, when you put different sets together, you end up with quite a range. So the Faber-Castell, those are oil-based. They are harder than the Prismacolors, makes it easier to sharpen them. Um, they're easier to control and layer, but you don't get that intensity of color quite so fast. So, um, you know, I, I think there's, they both, they can both be used together. There's no problem there. Um, they're just different types of pencil. And then Prismacolor came out with sort of, you know, um, a, a, a third variety of pencil, which uh, people really love to mix in there. And these are the very thins and they are a harder pencil, uh, much more like graphite. Um, they resist uh, cracking and, and all of that soft uh, crumbling, you know, that can be a problem with the, with the uh, regular Prismacolor. Um, they are great for detailing and lettering. They are not good for layering, in, um, you know, per se. You can definitely use them, but it's just, uh, you just don't get as much of a deposit. But for the details and fine stuff, they're really wonderful. And there are other brands out there too. Um, uh, gosh, probably you know five or six that are considered good quality. So these are just ones that, that I'm familiar with. I wanted to see what they were like and see uh, if I could recommend them to you. And I would definitely say, uh, you know, both all of these brands are really good. Now, you don't have to go out there and get 120 pencils. Um, I think it's perfectly fine to start with a small set. And then what will happen is you, you'll say to yourself, gosh, I really wish I had a certain orange. And all of these pencils can be bought individually. 
And, you know, you may read about a particular artist who says, oh, I like this set of pencils. So you might try a few that uh, he or she have recommended. Um, and you'll sort of build up your, your pencil sets that way. Um, because of work I was doing a number of years ago, I ended up with a lot of colored pencils, many of which I don't use. I really just have sort of a core set of, of oh, 10 or 20. And I can send the names of those to you for the Prismacolor. For the Faber-Castell, I'm not quite sure uh, what those would, would be because I'm only getting used to the new set. So um, in the follow-up PD, PDF, I'll include the, the Prismacolors that I'm using. Um, but you know, you may have your own ideas of what colors you like and want to use. So we talked uh, quickly last week about layering, burnishing, scoring, and fusing. So I'm not going to read all of this uh, ag again right now. I want to include it in the PDF, but I want to show you an example. So burnishing, um, you can use a lighter colored pencil or you can use, I used the clean end of a rounded paintbrush to, to do this. All you're doing is you are um, you're mixing those color layers you've put down in such a way that the wax or the oil um, just, you know, fuses the color together a little bit more uh, with a little more softness. Now, as I've said before, I personally like to have the white of the paper still show through. I like that texture. But if you don't want that and you wanted it to be much smoother, burnishing is the way to do it. Now, burnishing is done at the end, because if you do it halfway through, you will have a very hard time adding any more layers to the top. So that's kind of something to do at the end. And if you're not sure how it's going to turn out, do experiment on the side of the paper. Put those same colors in some layers and burnish and see if you like the look. So scoring, uh, this is a lot of fun. I used a relatively soft paper. This was um, Fabriano Artistico. You know how much I love that paper. And what I did was I took the end of a mechanical pencil and I just put the lead back into the mechanical pencil. So it was just the, the metal point. And I just uh, made some sort of grass-like shapes. And then I went ahead and, and did colored pencil on top. Now, what is useful is to go... Um, in a perpendicular. So if you've got all of your scoring going one way, you want to go across that so that you don't end up mashing colored pencils into the lines that you just made. Otherwise, you won't be able to keep keep them white. Um, sometimes people also will put, say, like a pale color down, say pale pink, score that, and then put other colors on top so that the lines are, are pink. So, you know, uh, you can try different things on that, but it's a nice texture to add. Up on the upper right-hand corner, um, I, I just dissolved um, the, the mixture I had made using some solvent. So I just used min mineral spirits because I had it around. But I tried the other day with acetone, uh, nail polish remover, and, and that works fine as well. Now, it's not easy to control. So often you'll do this kind of blending or this sort of dissolving like this uh, with the idea that you are going to go ahead and put some more colored pencil on top. So it, it helps it absorb into the paper a little bit. So you don't have so much of a wax buildup, but it's not always easy to know what your results are going to be. And, and uh, definitely try some experiments with this before you, you, you know, do your whole beautiful drawing in the solvent. Um, but one thing I have used uh, to, with great success is watercolor undercolored pencils. And you can always use an acrylic, uh, a thin acrylic um, wash to do the same sort of thing. And what this does is it helps move your whole process along a lot faster and gives you a bit more vibrancy to your colors. So you can see here watercolor that I put some colored pencil on the top versus the same colors just using uh, colored pencil. So it's a different look. Um, and you can use it, you know, where you want to on a, on a painting. You, you want to think out a little bit in advance where you want that brightness, you know, maybe on your, your main subject matter, but you don't want it on the other sub, the background or something like that. But it's a, it's a good technique to use. I will say that there's a, you can also use markers like Prismacolor markers. So you've got Prismacolor colored pencils and they have uh, magic markers that are basically the same colors. Um, but a marker is a very intense amount of color to put down. Um, and I find that the watercolor is a little bit easier to control. You really want, you want some color, but you don't want to obscure where you might want light areas. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right, so we're just about to, to dive in right now. Um, the, uh, oh, somebody asked me uh, how, how I do the scoring. I literally... I just draw on the paper. 
um, you know, wherever, like say I wanted blades of grass, I just take whatever that, that, that piece of metal is, or for me, the end of the mechanical pencil that didn't have any lead in it. Uh, it could be anything that doesn't leave a mark. Um, and you just press hard enough on the paper, and this is where you would use a soft paper or illustration board to get this kind of look. Um, and you just draw whatever it is you want to do. So some people use it, for example, like on a bearded iris, those little fibers of the beard uh, would be a perfect place to pre-score on your drawing. After you've done the graphite, you would, you would score where you want to keep light before you start the color, and then you'd be able to start in at that point. So in this particular case, um, the, uh, it, it, oh, someone's asked, um, do I use the pencil uh, on the watercolor while it's still wet or wait for it to dry? Definitely wait till it um, dries. Otherwise, you could uh, pull up the paper that's underneath because the colored pencil tends to be a little harder. Um, and also, you'll get kind of a mottled effect. And I will say that I don't use watercolor pencils, it, wa the watercolor colored pencils. Um, I haven't had great luck with them myself, and I certainly am, have no expertise to share at this point. So right now, we're just talking about dry colored pencils on top of, of watercolor. That, that you allow it to completely dry before you add the colored pencil. So let's get back to this color wheel, because I know that I know there were some questions about exactly uh, you know, some of these terms of what to do. So we know what the primary colors are, yellow, blue, and red. We've heard about those you know, since we were in school. And complementary colors, uh, that's what we introduced last week, the idea of the color that's across the wheel. So Blue and orange are complementary colors to each other. Green and red are complementary to each other. Yellow and purple. So analogous is another word. Analogous just means next to. So if you are going to, for example, uh, you know, color the orange, uh, color the lemon, you would definitely think, well, gosh, I probably am going to use some of those analogous colors. I'm going to use some green and some orange. Those would be naturally the colors that you would think of adding in. Um, it's a little less natural to think about using the complementary color. So. Here are sort of some rules of thumb, and every, every rule is made to be broken, <laughs> but this is how I approach it. And so it, hopefully it's a good jumping um, off spot for you as well. I start in colored pencil in the shadows and the shaded areas of whatever it is, doesn't matter what the subject is. Um, and now, just like last week, sometimes I decide I'm going to start somewhat in the middle, but that's because I've got the experience of doing the shading first, and I know where I'm going to go. So as you're just, if you're a beginner to color pencil, just start off in the shadows and the shaded areas. If you're making a deep color uh, under an object, you use dark colors that are complementary under your local colors. So, <coughs> excuse me, down here we have this lemon. <coughs> excuse me. The, the local color is yellow. Therefore, the, the complementary colors that I'm going to use to create that shadow uh, underneath, I'm going to look over across the color wheel to the purples, also the blues and reds. I could go any of those directions. All of those are across the color wheel and will give that complementary feel to, to the drawing overall. So over here, I, I put specifically what I would do if it was me. I would be doing an underlayer that would be purple's complement which would be uh, purple. Now, I could also use a dark red like Tuscan uh, red or and some blue, because those, when they combine, will make purple. Um, I also might uh, use some dark green and any other colors I actually see there. So to a certain extent, although I always go for that Tuscan red, that dark red, and, and indigo blue, that dark neutral blue, I love those colors because they kind of make it easy for me to always know where to start. But I could just as easily use a dark purple or a dark green. And, and it has to do with what I just, what I see in the actual uh, shadow. Now here, because I do see a reddish tinge in there, even though I know purple is the complement of yellow, I'm going to go ahead and use that dark red because I, I see a reddish tinge. You might see something completely different. So after I get those first layers down of the shading, um, and we're just talking about the shadow right now. We're not talking about the rest of the lemon. 
Over that, I would add some, a little yellow, a little green, maybe a little orange, paying attention to what I actually see in the, in the color. Like, for example, I see that over to the right of that shadow, there's a lot less yellow. So I would make sure to fade my yellow out when I get over to that side. So this is something we'll talk about in detail as we go through today's example. But let's see, let me get to the next Next slide here. But I wanted to, to go over this whole business of complementary colors just in a tiny bit more detail because I realized the examples I did in colored pencil last week were hard to see, uh, not only through the Zoom recording, but then by the time it got up in, onto YouTube, it was difficult to know what was going on. So I've done these little charts here, and they'll be in the PDF, starting with the basic color, blue, red, and yellow, and looking at how one could go about extending the color range, making a few more colors. These are colors that you can layer. You, these are colors you can use underneath. These are colors you can add on top. It doesn't matter. But what, what happens is that whether you, depending on how much pressure you use, the, the type of pencil, the order of color that you put them in, how hard you press, you'll end up with different shades. But these are the basic principles. So you can take blue, you could add a darker blue, and you come up with something kind of in the middle of those two blues. You could add an analogous color, something close on the color wheel, and that'll shift. It'll make it darker, but it'll also shift the color one way or the other. Like in this case, it shifts it a little bit more purple. Um, or you can add a complementary color that's opposite on the color wheel. And what that does is that neutralizes the color. Now, in paint, you can end up with a gray if you do that, just like you see here. In colored pencil, it's not quite so specific because you're going to still see the blue and orange. It kind of makes an optical mix where you've got color pigment next to each other, and from a distance, it would have a neutral uh, look. Up close, what it'll do, it'll just sort of almost brown or, or gray down the blue slightly, giving you another color. So likewise, the same thing for the red. You could use a darker red uh, to get a different color. You could use an analogous color like purple to get another color. Or you could use a complementary color. And when you mix green and red, you get sort of a brownish shade. And then over there with the yellow, you end up with three different types of yellow, depending on whether you're using a darker color, an analogous color, or a complementary color. Now, notice that when you add that purplish tinge to yellow, you end up with this kind of olivey yellow color. That's really useful when you are doing things like fruit, because sometimes you just can't get that feeling of form if you only have yellows and golds and oranges and orange yellows. You really need to sort of start pushing that um, you know, to something different. And a tiny bit of purple or magenta or lavender or you know, anything in the purple range will help get you there. So here we go on also, uh, whoops, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. So then if you then go to the other main colors on the, on the color wheel, the, the secondary colors, which are green, orange, and, and uh, purple that you get from mixing those primaries together, the same thing happens there. You can use a darker color, analogous color, or complementary color to extend the range of each one of these. So... It, when you mix your colored pencils, you will not get exactly what's in these squares um, necessarily because uh, this, I, of course, did in a graphics program to give you an idea of how it works. What is very useful, though, is for you to take any colored pencils you have and try the same type of mixing. doesn't matter which darker color. doesn't matter which analogous color. And on the complementary color, you can, you know, as long as it's basically across the color wheel, you can try different things and see what happens. I would also try seeing what happens when you put lighter colors over dark and dark over light. Because layering in colored pencil usually means lots of layers. Like, you know, by the time you finish, maybe 20 layers because you, you, you put some down. It wasn't quite enough. You put some more of another color. Oh, no, you want to put some more of that, you know, brighter color back on top of again. Um, and just having some direction of, of how that works will be useful. Now, um, in paint, I mix up all of these different color charts and I use them as reference. I don't do that with colored pencil, I have to say. After I started experimenting and figuring out what happened, I also realized that as I draw, it's very intuitive. I'm looking at the subject and I'm going, just like with that lemon shadow, go, I'm going, oh, I see a little more green here. Oh, that's a little bit more yellow. Maybe I'll add that. Or oh, this is a little blue over the side. 
And there isn't something on a color chart that tells me exactly where to go. So after I got used to how the colors worked initially, I, you know, I tried all the colored pencils and tried a few of the mixes. I just started because <laughs> I figured there was nothing like just sort of diving in to see how it was going to work. So I wanted to show you this picture that I, I got from a leaf and clay company. It's a company that supplies succulent plants. I've never bought from them, but I, I have to say their photography is amazing. <laughs> so. I wanted to show you that, so succulents are a very popular thing in colored pencil to draw, and you can see why. Uh, they've got that kind of dusty feel that lends itself to colored pencils. And um, I wanted to look just at, for a second at when you see all this color, it's hard to know kind of where to start. And one of the things that's important is this business of looking for overtones that I was talking about last, last week. So if we look following the arrows, at where at these different succulent leaves, you see that there's a sort of a reddish tinge, a reddish overtone. It's, it's a very subtle. It's not necessarily easy to see. And you might find, depending on the size of screen you're looking at today, that you have to wait to see this in the PDF to really to get the idea. But the reason I'm showing this to you is because if you did, you know, a blue succulent and a green succulent and a red succulent, and you didn't mix those colors back and forth the way they actually um, were in nature, you wouldn't get such a cohesive looking drawing as what you see actually right here, because you've got reflected light coming from these different succulents on each other. You've got just the colors in nature itself, which tends to have a lot of reds and orange and greens to everything. There's a lot of mixing on that goes uh, back and forth. And starting to, to look and go, okay, where do I see on each of these succulents a, a different color other than the main color? Like it might be a pink succulent or a, a purple one, but I see some I see some browns and I see some blues and maybe a little bit of green. And you start looking around for overtones. So here's another example, blue overtones. So once again, on each one of these ones I've picked out, there's a bluish tinge going on somewhere. And getting your eye trained to look for this, and it takes a while and colored pencil is an excellent way to do it, will help your painting if you are planning on painting or if you enjoy painting, because it, it's this sensitivity to these small shifts in color that when you're, when you're painting or drawing in colored pencil, um, it just brings everything to life. So rather than just having, you know, a purple succulent, green succulent, light blue succulent, Interplaying the colors and getting sensitive to where those colors might actually be in the objects you're looking at will make for a really successful drawing. And this is one of the reasons why colored pencil people love succulents, because they are just picture perfect for that. So here's a little bit of a, um, of a guide just, um, you know, to, to figure out how you're going to go about. This is, these are just suggestions on how to get started uh, with some of this sort of thing. Um, my, my re recommendation is, you know, starting with the shadows, start with the dark complementary colors. Look for where the darks are. So this is very much like no tan and all of that stuff that we've been doing, where we look for the darks first. It helps give some structure. And so thinking of complements, the shadows of green objects, you can start with dark reds and then add some dark blue moving away from the shadow core, the shadow core being where it's most intense. So on the lemon, the shadow core was where, where I kept talking about seeing the reds. You know. So I start with, you know, on green objects, I have a tendency to start with the dark red with, with Tuscan red or something similar. Um, and then I use uh, indigo blue moving away from, from the core, because I want it to, the blue will blend more easily with the greens I put down later. Now, when I do all of this, I am holding my pencil. I'm just going to grab a regular pencil. I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually working at, um, gosh, maybe a 30 degree angle from the paper. And I'm actually, I'm not like this. I'm, I'm, I'm not like this. I'm not putting a lot of pressure down. I'm holding my pencil further back from the end. And I'm, I'm being as light as I possibly can in those early layers uh, where I use Tuscan red and indigo blue, because I can always come back and put more down. But it is a nuisance to try to, to, to erase. Now, I will say the polychromos erase a lot better than the, um, the Prismacolor Premier. And I think that's to do with the wax content that's in the, the 
uh, premiere. But I have a tendency to think about color pencil as sort of a one-way street, <laughs> you know, just keep going forward and, and just count on the fact you aren't going to be able to take it back up again. Um, so then shadows of red and purple objects start with a dark green and then add some dark blue. So basically I'm, I'm looking at the complementary color and then I'm seeing what analogous color maybe I can bring in. Shadows of blue objects start with dark red and then add some dark green. Now, blue, as you know by now, the complement is orange, but orange underneath will not give you the depth of color. It'll start tending very brown. So I, and it's not really deep enough to get the shadows going. So I tend to go with dark red, which is kind of close, you know, kind of close and still sort of across the color wheel because that gives me the depth uh, in, the, in the blue objects. And then I'm, I might uh, add some dark green or other colors like that to start extending the range a bit. And then shadows of orange and yellow objects, um, I use dark blue and dark red or dark purple, because of course blue plus red is purple. So if you just want a shortcut, you can use a purple colored pencil underneath there. But that will help me get the shadows, you know, shadows underneath or the really deep shadows um, of these particular objects off to a good start. So, <laughs> let's see. All right, so this is what we are going to draw today. And we have um, a little over a half an hour, thank goodness. And what we're gonna do is we're going, we're going to go step by step through this. We're not gonna draw this whole thing wall to wall. We're just gonna take you know whatever segment you feel like. Um, uh, I, I love the name of this, Calabazilla. <laughs> Isn't that just great? But this goes back to what I said last week, is that when you're picking something to draw in colored pencil, pick something that has complementary colors in and color assortment, whether it's succulents, whether it's something like this, berries on a vine with some leaves, uh, you know, anything that has a, has a variety of form and texture will make it a lot more fun. Um, it, one has a tendency to think, hey, I'm going to draw a bouquet of flowers because those, those are so beautiful and people do colored pencil and flowers. Um, but I would say that is a challenging way to get started. And something like this, you know, vines, leaves and something with, the, you know, grapes, uh, you know, gourds, pumpkins, <laughs> all of that stuff. Those are uh, bittersweet. That's another good thing to, to draw. Uh, any of those types of subject matter are just a little easier to differentiate one object from another. So if you're not getting the differentiation in the color that you want yet, you can at least get started with some of the objects. Now, in a half hour, we're only gonna get so much. So don't think we're going to end up with a finished drawing. What we're doing is we're kind of like, I used to teach swimming and we'd stand on the side of the pool and I would make everybody do the strokes before we got in the water. So that's what we're doing today. We're practicing the strokes before we jump into the water. So let's get started. And if you're drawing along with, with just a uh, pencil and paper, I want you to go ahead and do this the, be the best you possibly can using darks and lights and all the things that you have been practicing all summer in terms of, of getting the most value out of, this, uh, out of this drawing. So what I'd like you to do is to go ahead and start with an OTAN. Now this is not, you don't have to do the whole rectangle. You don't have to do the whole thing. But as you see in my little example down on the right, I just decided, okay, I'm going to key in on a little bit of the gourd, that one leaf, and the flower. And then what I did was I added in some of the dark, where the dark is going to be in the background. Because really, apart from the gourd green and the middle of the flower, there isn't a lot that's dark. Everything else is sort of in color. But you may have seen many botanical illustrations and illustrations of flowers and plants that are done on a white background. And that's a lovely look. And it certainly is easier to control because you have no background. You don't have to worry about it. All your concentration is on the plant. And particularly people who are doing the more scientific type of colored pencil, that, that's the way they do it. But I would encourage you to throw a little background in there. Um, I think it's useful because when you ever paint or do anything like that, you're going to have to have some background in there. Um, and it's good to sort of figure out what is the design of a background going to look like if I don't want to draw the whole rectangle. So in this case, I, I said, well, I want some dark here. I want some dark here, you know, uh, looking at this, at this straw, um, but I don't want it all over the place. And this is, this is nicely balanced and I'm ready to move on to the next um, phase. So I'm just going to move us along to the next phase because I know you guys are really good at your notans now and it doesn't take you any time to do them. 
So this is super light um, to look at if you're looking on a small screen. But the next step is to sketch out whatever it is you're planning on drawing uh, using graphite, using a really light touch. And what I did also was I just sort of included some of the grass, the straw underneath, some directional lines to kind of indicate where that was going to go. Um, and I didn't put leaves or anything where on my notan I had decided I wasn't going to do anything. I did a rectangle just to help me kind of place it. Um, uh, you can do that or not do it. Doesn't doesn't matter whatsoever. Um, I'm doing it more for the class purposes. I think normally I probably wouldn't necessarily include that. But I'll give you a couple of minutes just to draw this out. Now, one second. Okay. Um, do take a little time at this stage. I am going to give you a few minutes to do this, to check those angles and including check the angles of the petals as you go around the petals, check the angles of that. If you're doing that one big leaf that's sort of you know up in front there, check the angle of those uh, leaves, how the vines come across. Um, you know, take a few moments just to get your basic placement right. Because with colored pencil, you can either color over those lines or you can erase them, make them lighter before you get started. But once again, the preparation is really, really useful. So, you know, I did my first sketch and then I took my pencil and I double checked my angles. And sure enough, I had some wrong. I had some of the vines, you know, not growing exactly where I needed them to. So I took a few minutes just to correct all of that. So give it a, give it a few minutes. I'm, um, I'm going to look for something I want to read to you. So I'm going to put myself on mute for a second. Okay, while you're sketching, I'm going to read this. Now, this is from a book called Botanical Gardens, uh, Botanical Gardens, Botanical Drawing Using Graphite and Colored Pencils by Sue Vise. And I've got a couple of books to recommend, which I'll include in the PDF. And I'll try to remember to show them to you at the end of the class. When I was reading through this, looking for, for tips, you know, to give um, to you, I thought people are often asking about the grading of, of regular pencils, of graphite pencils, and why the numbers are what they are. So she's got a really good explanation. And I'm going to read this to you now while you're working on your sketch. Okay. Graphite pencils are graded by the amount of graphite and clay they contain and are num numbered from low to high. An HB pencil sits right in the middle of the range, containing equal amounts of both. So the H grades uh, the H on the pencil denotes hard. It contains less gra graphite than the B range and more clay. The higher the number next to the H, the less graphite the pencil contains and the harder and lighter in tone uh, or depth it will become. The B grades of pencil, that stands for, the B stands for blackness. I never knew that. The B pencils contain more graphite and less clay than the H range. The higher the number, the more graphite it will contain, and therefore the softer and darker the pencil will be. And then the F grade, the F grade pencil sharpens to a finer firm point. This grade is only just on the harder side of the, side of the scale and comes between the HB and the H. I never knew that. I thought that was really fascinating, and I thought you might want to know about it too. <laughs> okay, so... We're going to move on to the first uh, step on, with the color. So the first thing that I would like you to do is uh, starting with the shadows and the shaded area of the flower, gourd, leaves, stem, or background, whatever it is you're doing. Um, have a look at this and, and go, okay, where are the shadows in the shaded area? What is it that I, um, that I want to get in first? So this is very much the same way I've been showing you how to approach drawing in general, is getting those darks in first. Because if you do that, that sort of anchors the whole drawing and helps you get started. So 
the, the complication comes is, well, which color, which color do I use? So if the local color, the color of the object is green or blue, start shading the darkest areas with, with a dark red or a dark purple. You can use a dark purple, but I like a dark red. If the local color is yellow or orange, start with a purple or you can use some red and blue. You can just start shading with red and blue. So this is where, this is where it's really uh, interesting, this whole business of the, of the blue and the red using together. I tend to, if I were going to uh, co color something that is yellow or orange, I have a tendency to start with, with the, the dark blue, um, but keep it, you know, keep it pretty under control. Don't get too carried away. And then put the red over it to make that purplish tone, but then maybe extend uh, the, the red a little bit more and then perhaps add in like a magenta or, or some sort of purpley color to, to extend to the lighter part of the shadow. So just as we've been talking about, you know, shadows that we see, how they have gradations to them, depending on how much light is being reflected down. The same thing is happening as you're coloring with colored pencil. You know, the, the shading doesn't just sort of break off at, at a hard point. It has a tendency to sort of, um, to fade out a little bit. And you can see in my sketch down here on the gourd, what I ended up doing, because that is a, a green object, so I started off shading the darkest area with, with dark red, and that was, to me, that the, the dark area that I saw from the, sh the shadow that was made by the leaf above it. So to me, I saw this dark area coming across. So I put down some, some red in the darkest area, and then as the as it gets a little bit less dark, as that, as that shadow sort of fades out and goes into the green, um, I'm sort of prepping in advance for where I want the green to be able to meld nicely with the darkest part of the shadow. And I'm using the, the blue as kind of a bridge to that. And then I did the opposite sort of thing on the, uh, on the, uh, the yellow flower. I started with the blue and then I used the red as kind of the bridge to the orangey colors that I'll use later. So this takes a little while to get used to. And, uh, you know, if you just start with those complementary colors up front, it'll get you in the right direction. And then you can sort of start working in your own ideas of what these color, what the dark and the light ought to be. But what I'm basically doing is, is I'm starting with the darkest colors that aren't blacks or browns in the color range to establish those dark shading shadow areas. And you'll also see that I've, I've done some color in the background area, because according to my notan, I wanted to have some of that darker background because it'll show off the leaves and the flowers by the time I get to the end. So the red layer that I put down and the blue layer, I'm not looking for where is every last piece of straw there. I just sort of made some abstract designs that kind of resembled straw-like objects. Now, for this particular ex exercise, I won't, there, there isn't time to actually develop this properly in terms of the background and such. But what I am doing, and what you'll see as we go through the, um, the next steps, is that I'm trying to keep the colors of the background a little bit different, uh, not right at this stage, but as we proceed on, from everything else that's sitting on top. Because that is another way to differentiate foreground from background. Um, and in colored pencil, it's a little bit more necessary than in paint. Because you do have, the, the texture is very similar. I can't, I can't suddenly put on gobs of paint or, or suddenly do light paint like I might do on a canvas. So I've got the same sort of texture kind of all over the place for colored pencil. I need to make sure that I'm using value and color to help me differentiate one part from another. So this will this bit will, I'll give you another five minutes or so to, to work on this because it takes some thinking through. Um, and my the, the little sketch that I uh, have down there, um, you know, I probably spent more of more time on this stage than I did on the others, trying to establish how, you know, where the complementary colors were, and then thinking ahead to the yellows or greens or blues that I wanted to put down next, and how is that going to work? Now, while you're working on this, I want to point out a couple of things. And one is that, you know, for that light green on the gourd stripes or the lightest green on the top of the uh, vines or the light blue on that one leaf or the, the pale yellow on the, on the curled over uh, uh, flower, 
it is very difficult to get those super pale colors in colored pencil. Now, there are ranges of pastel colors that will help you with that. But to start off with, uh, you know, rather than just relying on a color uh, pencil to, to color that in, this is a really good place to get using, used to using your colored pencil as lightly as you possibly can, holding it back away from the tip and, and using sort of a, an, almost an elliptical, kind of an oval motion. So you're not sort of sketching back and forth in lines like you might uh, if you're hatching or something like that, but you're almost making kind of a, almost a round uh, pattern to get the coverage of the colored pencil down. Now this comes, with, this comes with practice and every artist I know sort of does it a different way, which is why different colored pencil artists work looks different as well. Um, but basically what you're trying to do is you're sort of, you know, if you were trying to wash your car, <laughs> you know, you might use the round, you know, sort of a roundish uh, motion to make sure you were covering everything and you weren't leaving any spot. So it's sort of like that. If you think about uh, that same kind of motion when you're working in colored pencils, that'll be really useful. About three more minutes on this. I have another interesting little excerpt to, to read for you, so I'll have a quick look for that. Oh, here it is. Okay. So while you're while you're working on this part, we're gonna read about how pencils get made. Because <laughs> I thought this was really cool too. So this is also from um, Sue Weiser's book. She did a ton of research for this. So she goes, um, in the 16th century, graphite deposits were found in Borrowdale, Cumbria, in England. The local people, many of whom were traditional farmers, found that graphite could be used for marking sheep. The deposits of graphite were found to be solid enough to be sawn into sticks, making it a useful marker for carpenters and artisans. The first pencil was a chunk of graphite wrapped in sheepskin, which later became wrapped in string the user unwrapping the string as the pencil wore down. Between 1600 and 1800, graphite in lump form was also found to be useful as a lubricant for medicine and in the manufacture of armaments. In 1793, Britain was at war with France and it became impossible for graphite to be exported from England. The French company Conte subsequently de uh, developed artificial graphite and the Conte crayon as we know, so that Borrowdale graphite was no longer unique. The first recorded pencil making factory was founded in 1832 in Keswick, England. And in the 1850s, a machine was invented by William Monroe in America, which was capable of making grooves in wooden slats for the manufacture of pencils we know today. There are now numerous pencil manufacturers around the world and all they, although and there are always going to be some subtle differences between factories. The basic method for manufacturing pencils remains the same, and each pencil will go through the process. For graphite pencils, graphite and clay are mixed in a kneader with water. The degree is determined by the proportions of graphite and clay. Softer degrees contain more graphite and harder ones more clay. When mixing for colored pencils, pigment, binder, and fillers are mixed in the kneader to exact recipes for each color. The mixed ingredients are hydraulically pressed into slugs to remove all air for smoother extrusion. The material is pressed through an accurate die at 200 tons of pressure. The resulting cores are cut into lengths and loaded into drying tins. The die size differs for each type of pencil. The cores are continuously rotated to keep the cores straight during the two hour drying process in a gas fired oven. The cores are then impregnated with molten wax or oil. Various wax mixtures give different writing qualities. And in the case of colored pencil, it is the wax or oil that transfers the color onto the paper. Then pencil slats are used to make the cores into pencils. Incense cedar slats from California um, are nine pencils wide. The slats are machined so that there are nine grooves, half as deep as the graphite clay rod is thick, into which the cores are glued. Another slat is glued on top to make a sandwich. The sandwiches are then shaped into pencils by very fast rotating cutters, producing nine pencils from each sandwich. Anyway, isn't that interesting? I never knew about that. So I thought you might be interested as well. So let's move on to the next, uh, the next stage in your colored pencil. So what we're going to do now 
is is move on to uh, the to adding in some of the local color. So you still want to make sure that you're keeping the areas free that you want to have light. But now it's time to start adding in some blues and greens, uh, adding in some yellows and oranges, uh, you know, some reds, uh, any other color that you think. It's not time to color everything in the local color yet. So you're still building up layers underneath, um, still trying to, to work out, you know, what other colors may be reflected from the leaves? Um, you know, can I see sort of an orangish quality, for example, to that gourd? I, I sort of looked at it and I, I said, well, yeah, we've got green, but I, I think I see kind of this orange shade. So I'm going to put that down first before the green goes on top. Now, this whole business of seeing tints and seeing colors and things is really very individual to the artist. You may be looking at that going, I don't see a darn thing. <laughs> I don't see anything but a green gourd and where the heck is she getting orange from? But to me, I guess, I guess I'm so used to looking, you know, I do portraiture, right? So I'm used to looking for very subtle color shifts. And in this, what, what I kind of see is this reflected color from the yellow flower sort of coming down on that on that gourd and also up on the underside of that leaf on the left hand side i see a little orangish tinge under there maybe a little orangish tinge to where that vine is hitting the leaf as well and so you don't have to worry about being a camera right if you see a little orange you can put a lot of orange you don't have to be restricted you could even put a different color you don't actually see. But what I think is wonderful about colored pencil is you can pump up color to be somewhat unrealistic and it can make a fascinating drawing. So if you remember last week, we saw um, an artist who'd done a bow of leaves, uh, fall leaves, and they were gorgeous, orange, purple, green, red, yellow, everything. You know, she had taken reality and she had pumped it up and it worked beautifully in colored pencil. So, you know, you don't have to feel like, oh, if this doesn't look exactly like the, the photograph, I'm not doing it right. Absolutely not. What you're trying to do is you're trying to make this look as interesting as possible. You have only your colored pencils to work with and they don't work well to make all of these other colors. If you don't layer some interesting color in there, it's not going to happen by itself. It's not, you're not necessarily going to find that the colored pencils you have do all the color things that you want to have happen. So this business of starting to add in color that you see in different places is really kind of important. Um, and the idea of local color going down near the end to me is important because then the local color, the green of the gourd or the, the bluish color of the, of the leaf or the paler green of the vine or the yellow of the flower, now it has all of that interesting color under play to sit on. Um, what you'll find, it, particularly with color, colors like yellow, is if you do it the opposite way around and go, hey, I'm just going to put my yellow down first, and then I'm going to add all of those other darker colors on top. To begin with, yellow doesn't really play well with other colors in that way. It's, it's such a, uh, I don't know exactly what the component is that makes it that way, but it's a strong color. And when you start adding these other colors on, trying to get the depth, red on top and blue on top, they'll end up sitting on top you know, like a, like a layer cake, and they won't blend into the colors underneath, and they won't also sit very smoothly on, on the color. So when you put the yellow, the lighter color on top, it blends around some of those lower layers. It'll sort of mix together those, those reds and blues. Uh, you know, it'll help them, it'll help have a little more cohesion. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you'll discover as you play around. That, that, you know, this kind of color mixing, what works well, what doesn't work well, is, is super important. I also want to point out that as I was putting down my blues for, my, uh, for that bluish leaf over to the left, I realized I did not have a blue that was light enough, like in itself, to, to put down like a thick layer of that paler color. So I had to be really careful that as I put down the blue that I saw on the, on the far side of the leaf that's darker... Um, that I had to make it differentiate. And you can see that in my little sketch. I had to make sure it was darker by far in the same value range um, from, from where the light was being reflected off, off the leaf on the other side. So, you know, you'll get used to looking at this stuff. And I will say, 
if I had the usual few hours it would take me to really draw this properly, um, you know, I would have time to be subtle. I would have done it larger. You know, this is probably about a four by six drawing because I was trying to get it done quickly. Uh, and it doesn't contain any of the subtlety I would normally try to work in there. So if you're finding yourself also getting lost, not having subtlety, not being sure where the color goes, just keep going forward. You know, like I said, this is just us practicing the swimming strokes. Um, my hope is that, you know, after the class at some point, you can sit down, take a breath and go, okay, let's start this process again. Follow through the steps that Elizabeth talked about and see how this works when I actually can take the time to do it. Now, one thing I, I did was when I put down the orangish colors on the flower, I actually put it down two or three times, you know, sometimes lighter, sometimes I, I got a little darker in certain places. And I all started to, also started to try to differentiate between that curled over bit of the yellow flower and, and the darker bit underneath. So as you, as you build your layers in colored pencil, you can look for opportunities to kind of sharpen up the edges, you know, of, of, the, of the darker color versus the lighter color. Um, you know, it, it's hard to make those crisp at the end. So you want to kind of crisp them up as you go. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the next step. I know that we're moving quickly here. So this is that stage I've talked about before where you kind of reserve the highlights. Now, we don't really have an awful lot to do here. Um, you know, we've, on the yellow, we want those, those brighter yellows to be bright in the, in the final iteration. Um, and there are some places on the, uh, you know, maybe on the, the leaf, maybe on the, um, on the vine, where uh, you might want a brighter highlight at some particular um, point. So I was... I was pretty quick. I just used um, a light green and, a, and a, a yellow. I just picked any yellow to sort of reserve those, those highlights. Basically, I wasn't so worried about what color is it going to end up in the end. I just wanted it to look different from everything else. And I wanted when I put that local golden yellow over most of these things, I wanted there to be some sort of differentiation still there. So this is, that's a, a pretty, a pretty uh, quick step to add in. Um, now, if I had a pale blue, which I don't, or a pale green and all of those things, I don't have the pastel range of colors, um, this would be where I would go ahead and put in the pale blue of that leaf, or, or I would use that instead of the yellow for the top of the vines, that kind of thing. So, you know, you have, you have what you have, you use what you can use. Um, if, if you don't have um, any of the pale colors that you feel you need, then you just let the... the uh, color of the, the uh, white of the paper come through, you know, and with the light shading of the colored pencil, you just let it be whatever it is. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to the next step only because I know you guys understand this and it's just a matter of doing it. So this is as far as I was able to get in the time uh, that we have. Um, what I did at this point is I started adding in more color. So now I'm starting to actually add in the, the local color. I, I picked a gold color started adding it to the flower, I immediately found that it sort of uh, not washed out, but kind of made everything a middle value. So I had to come back in with a little bit of, of red, a little bit of orange, a little bit of blue again, to, to sort of start getting that feeling of the curling over leaf to find that center again, because it all sort of disappeared. Um, and I didn't, I didn't get, it's not very perfect, that's for sure. But I, I was like, okay, well, at least I've got some lights and some darks. Um, that part, you know, is getting a good start. Uh, I then went over to the gourd and I quickly tried to add some local color to that. And you can see what I mean about how those under layers just sort of get blended in with the green as you put it over the top. And then I went a little darker with the green where I knew I needed that, that darkness. But there's a little more richness to the green than if I'd only used that one dark green to try to get everything out of it. And likewise, with the, with the leaves and with the vine, I just started adding it a bit more color, a little bit of, a little more blue, a little bit more greeny color, um, you know, and I didn't get but so far, and, and I imagine <laughs> you won't either at this particular point. But it's a good way to sort of test out how you would go forward. And then the, the last thing I had an opportunity to do was to add a little more color into the background. Now, at this point, I had completely abandoned my 
my straw. Because <laughs> I'm like, okay, I don't even have time to think about that. You know, we won't get this class started if I don't actually get this little sketch done. So what I did instead was I took um, a purplish color that wasn't in anything else I was drawing at that particular point. And I used it to darken up the background in such a way that the, it made the yellow pop and it made the green stand out a little bit more. So if, I, if I'm just going to page back for a second to the previous drawing, if I go from the previous drawing to the current drawing, you can see how by just adding you know, a color that is different from the other, other colors, you, you start to tighten up that whole background and you start to, to give a little bit more punch to the colors that you want to, act, um, to have actually seen. So like I said, this whole, you know, a colored pencil drawing takes hours. It does not take a half an hour. Um, and if you're out sketching with your colored pencils um, and you have a half an hour and you get this far, you've done really well. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of thing where you sketch something like this so that you have the opportunity to look at it really hard to, you know, to figure out what your drawing might be to figure out how some of the colors do work so you get some approximation of what that object looks like. You know, you, you go, okay, it's a little more yellow, a little more red, it's a little more gold. You know, exactly where, where is it on the color, um, in the color scheme. And that way, when you go home, you can do a more complete, uh, you know, drawing either from your imagination or from a photograph, but you'll have a good sense of where the problem areas will be, uh, you know, where the focus should be and how the color can interrelate. Um, so I do like colored pencils to take around with me because they don't require anything but, you know, a sharpener. Um, and I can just go, in fact, I, I pre-sharpen them before I leave the house if I can possibly remember to, um, and then try to use them without even trying to sharpen them out in the field. And so I can get something like this, you know, in a half hour. And I usually don't try to do more than that if I'm literally sitting, you know, on a bench or, you know, chair or in a field or, or whatever. Um, I, I consider if I get to this point, it's an exercise in looking. It's an exercise in observing. And this is sort of how things work for me with portraiture as well. When I go to visit a client, I take photos, I talk to the person, I do a sketch, I might do a little color study. It's not a little painting. It's not a little portrait of the person. Um, it is an opportunity for me to sort of do visual note taking where I'm, I'm sort of processing what I look at. And, you know, hopefully what I do, you know, actually on the paper or canvas, you know, bears some relation to, to the person I'm looking at. Um, but I'm not, the, the purpose isn't to create a master work. And, and likewise, when you're doing colored pencil in a half an hour, the, the, the object is not to, to um, create a master work, is to try out those strokes, is to see for this particular scene, how is that going to work? Okay, let's go ahead and wrap that up because I've got one more thing I want to show you before the, uh, the end of the class. All right, so that'll give you something to try at home, eh? <laughs> so here's another, this is another uh, potential drawing subject that you might want to try if you're feeling um, courageous. And this is a good example of, of dealing with, so trees are their own thing, uh, you know, and don't just reach for the brown pencil <laughs> when it comes to doing trees. Um, the oranges and such that you see in, in, for example, this tree, which is, this is a tree in Japan. It's, uh, it's very, um, uh, very stunning in, in the amount of orange it has. You know, it doesn't tend towards brown, which is why I wanted to start you off with it. So when you look at something like this and you think, well, oranges, you know, what's, what's across the color wheel, you know, oranges and reds and things like that, where you're talking about the, you know, the purples and the greens and this, that, and the other. So when you're laying in those darks, when you're getting started on something like this, that's relatively complicated, but is interesting because of the light and dark patterns and those wonderful um, branches. The first thing to do is to start off with those purples and greens, even on the tree trunk is to get in some shading um, because what you're, the reason why is the, the purples, of course, you know, the blue and the red, 
Um, you know, you can always use Tuscan red and, and indigo blue to get those colors. Uh, but also you've got the green reflection of the tree. You've got reflected color from all of those pine needles coming in and casting a greenish tinge. So can you see us as those branches head off into the distance, uh, you know, in the, ed in the ends, how they have a very muted color to them. That is a perfect way, to, uh, the perfect way to get that muted color is to have some green underlay because it's a complement of the orangey or redder, browner colors that'll go down on top. So this is just a very, very interesting exercise. You don't have to draw every branch that's here. You could decide my tree is only going to have five branches on it, but it's going to do some of those same things. You might just select a few branches you think are really interesting. But the thing that is, the reason why I think this is a marvelous exercise is because when you are out there and you see a tree, you won't feel that you need to just, you know, go for the brown pencil. You'll be thinking about the other colors that work their way in. I'd like to point out two other things as well. When you look at branches in general, there tends to be a lot of warm reflected red light, orange light coming from below. This is something that you see all the time in nature. Perhaps not today, it's raining outside, so it's a little difficult to see reflected light. But that's something to look for. Orangish, reddish tones underneath the branches, and then paler, uh, actually bluer tones coming down um, from, this, from the sky, from the reflected light from above. The other thing I'd like to point out is the darker areas of green uh, in the foliage, that's a perfect place to use the complement of green, which is the orangish color, to get those duller, more neutral greens. So this is just a really good exercise. You can simplify it any way you want to. All right, so wrap up. So interesting colored pencil drawings are achieved by looking for all the colors you um, can see and building by using underlayers of complementary colors. Choose a subject matter to draw that already contains contrast. Uh, you know, add some, add some color. If it's a still life, add some complementary color in there, um, you know, like a cloth under uh, plants or, or um, you know, adding a, a red to a, a green object. Um, Mess about with your colored pencils to see what they can do because each brand is a little different. Consider doing some um, drawings where you've done it mostly in graphite and only a small section is in colored pencil because uh, it, it's an interesting look um, and it also speeds things up. Um, look around in the world for reflected light. This is something useful regardless of what, uh, you know, you know, watercolor, colored pencil, painting, doesn't matter what. Um, and, and look uh, at the shadows and try to figure out why. Why are they working the, the way they are? And I'm going to stop um, screen sharing and just show you a couple of books because I don't want to forget this. Okay, so two books, and I pointed these out last summer. I really love these. One of them is Botanical Drawing Using Graphite and Colored Pencils, and that's the book I was just reading from by Sue Vise. And the other one, and I'll put this information in the PDF, the other is by Anne Swan, Botanical Portraits uh, with Colored Pencils. Now, both of these books are that more, uh, you know, uh, uh, the type of uh, botanical drawing that has a white background. Um, you know, they're not scenes and things like that. But they have wonderful information. They're both really good books on colored pencil in general. Um, so I'd highly recommend them. There are a lot of other books out there, too. These are just a couple that I happen to have. And we'll definitely get you started if you'd like to, to sort of see how somebody else does it. Now, I will tell you, not everybody does the colored pencil the way that I do with the underlayer and the complementary colors. So when you read through and, and you're like, why doesn't she using you know, indigo blue under that? That would really make a better color. Then you have learned something about colored pencil that even someone who wrote a book doesn't know. So I hope you have some fun trying this out. Uh, you know, whether no matter what you're doing, whether you're, you know, cucumbers, anything, complicated trees, gourds, um, but colored pencils is a, lot, is a lot of fun. And what you learn by messing around with them will help you greatly, no matter the, the type of painting that you'd like to do, if painting is something that you're interested in as well. All right. Till next time, folks. I, uh, I really appreciate your time today. Yeah.